this time I'm going to speak to you about the second invasive, which is Alpinia alugas. We normally call it ginger, which you could see here. This is what used to be part of a forest, the swamp forest. Now this is of particular importance to me because this is part of my PhD. But what you find, you have people who come in and because they use the moras for agriculture, they burn, all right? The alpinia again, it is an invasive, but people value it because it provides, I want to say camouflage, but it blocks off people from seeing what's going on behind it. So when you have marijuana growing behind it, this is a nice camouflage and police wouldn't really come into there because it's kind of hard to chop through. So what they would do, they would go in, burn, let the place burn out, and they affect the diversity of the forest. So Alpinia, unlike Melaleuca, has been established over 30 years now in the lower Maras. And it has displaced a lot of the native swamp vegetation. So what we found was that when you had a forest stand, some part of it got burned and Alpinia would move in. And eventually that forest patch would die after repetitive burning and then you would only have Alpinia with no seedling coming up. So the aim of this assessment basically is to determine the impact of Alpinia and other plant invasives on the native biodiversity of the swamp forest patches in the Black River. So this is what I'm talking about. When you're going up the river, you have the marine police who normally come in. Over here you could see a burnt effects of burning and directly behind here, you have cultivation going on. And this is the swamp forest patches. So it's a good cover for those people practicing agriculture. And <laughs> this is what you find happening. This is, I was actually inside the plot going to assess the Melaleuca when I saw this fire and I went in. And we actually have a plot, well, this is directly behind me. And this is the fire. And unfortunately, this was the last picture taken with my camera until the boat capsized when I was trying to run out. So, yeah. Fire, you do have the risk of fires, and it is affecting the biodiversity. So we, what we did, we set out 20 by 60 plots in the larger patches, and 20 by 20 plots, which was further subdivided into five by five subplots. And we had 50 replicates, no, 38 replicates of the 20 by 20 permanent sample plots, and 20 replicates of the 20 by 60 sample plots. In the five by five plots, I went in and I assessed the presence and or absence of ginger where it was, where there was a 100% distribution, I used a one, a one meter square quadrant, um, took the number of plants within our plot, measured the height, and re replicated it three times and extrapolated the total amount of ginger you had in a five by five plot. Where you didn't have a 100% distribution, I just went in and I counted all the ginger yard within that plot and took the heights. So again, a picture of the morass. Here in pink is the ginger distribution, right? This green or light green patches here is your swarm forest patches. You have some over here also, which is accessible by road. And these over here are only accessible by river. I think I have a better picture of it. All right. So that's the same thing. That's the river here, and these are the forest patches in black. So it involved a lot of um, camping out. We actually had to stay out 
in the forest sometimes to do our field work. This is Janelle, she's also doing work on uh, the invasive toad. So we try to help out other projects while doing our work. And this is a sample of the plot where we string out 20 by 20s, identified tagged the trees. And this is the waterways which a lot of the marijuana users use to actually pass through the forest to go to the other side where they continue the activities. So we actually sampled 3.92 hectares of forest and a total of over 14,000 trees were sampled, right? And they represented 25 family trees. This, represent, this represented 43 um, plant species and the most abundant plant species were Fabaceae and Maritaceae. When we checked the red list, IUCN red list, it indicated that five of the endemic species were vulnerable, but what was worrying me is that only five, no, about 80% of the species were not evaluated. So we had basically no idea of their conservation status internationally. And while looking at the effect of one native species, we actually found the next native species, um, invasive species, sorry, which has the potential to become invasive, which was the African oil palm. And we found this species on the plot closer to the road. So we are, I also tried to look at the understory vegetation, looking at grasses, those that were invading and whatnot. And the whole aim of my work was to try and model the effects of Alpena 1 plus the native grasses plus human disturbances on the biodiversity of the swamp forest patches. So a species accumulation curve, by far you had um, anchovy pear, which is grass, being the most abundant. And, but this was only found in the two largest contiguous forest patches. And then again, you had 43 species being found. And because this didn't taper off, we tried to estimate the total amount of species we are expected to find. So we used two different estimates, the chow and the jackknife. We found 61 and 57 species potentially in the Black River Maras. And this is the distribution of the species richness according to class. I started measuring the plants that were two centimeters and above. DBH, diameter at breast height. So I further subdivided that into smaller trees and into larger trees. The smaller trees would be two to 10 centimeters and everything greater than 10 centimeters DBH, I considered it an adult. And you could see in all the forest patches, you had native species being higher than the richness of native species being higher than non-native species, and also trees. This part is interesting because it's the only part that completely got burnt out, and you have alpinia throughout the plot. So it's a 20 by 20 plot. And we try to use dissimilarities to classify to classify the plots. And here you could see in eight, seven, and nine, that's where you have the African oil palm. Five, remember I told you, is a plot that completely got burnt out. And it only has, it has a 100% distribution throughout the 20 by 20 plot. So you could see that they're similar in terms of species composition. You had one and two where you actually had few spots or few 5x5 plots 
we actually had a pinna in it. And this is analysis of, of variants. We have the stems per hectare and the better diversity. So we try to look at species, um, species composition turnover between the different plots. And the letters represent um, those that are st 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 uh, Thank you. So the numbers represent statistical difference. And here you could see most of the plots in terms of species turnover were different. So alpinia abundance within the different patches. You had four patches where you had alpinia, basically. In the fifth patch, you had the most alpinia because it was burned, but you still had standing forest. So you could actually see the effect of the alpinia. So you had the number of plots, and this is five by five plots, because we had to assess the, the alpinia in a smaller quadrant. And then you have the mean abundance, and we estimated it. This is an estimate. Again, these are estimates. This is the amount I actually counted. So that's in the different patches. And in some 5 by 5 you only had like two alpino plots, plans. In others, you had as much as 917. So there's a marked difference between the alpino establishing and the alpino coming in. And you wouldn't see it in here, but there's a difference in height because obviously if it's just coming in, the height will be shorter. But then what we also found, the maximum height, in some of the patches where you had trees and alpinia, the alpinia would grow very tall. But when we try to look at this using a generalized linear model, we did find some difference in terms of species. In terms of the basal area. Now, this was kind of confusing to me because apart from alpinia presence, I also looked at burning, cutting, harvesting of thatch leaves, and the presence of traps to catch shrimp within the plots. And I tried to model this to see how it would affect diversity. I wasn't sure, however, if the alpinia would actually affect or push out, kill the forest patch, or was it an effect that whenever you had burning or disturbance effect, Alpina would actually come in and then establish. So I wasn't too sure if it was a causal effect or a relationship effect. But in all the patches, again, you had disturbances caused by human, humans. So in all the forest patches, you had people actually coming in and cutting wood. So we're trying to actually revise or do the reviews on the paper to get two or three peer-reviewed papers from this work. And again, these are questions we need to ask. Or I keep asking, well, there's a debate between me and my supervisor as to what is happening. Whether the Alpena is actually killing off the swamp forest, or is it because of the effects of man, where the alpina comes in and it establishes and it kills off this, the seedlings. So we actually have seedling work done, but this is not part of my project, so I can't analyze that data. But then we also wanted to find out the role species distribution models could play in actually managing alpina. So we wanted to model 
some for his presence and model the potential areas where we could actually have the spread of Alpena to see where, we'd act, where we could actually start managing the Alpena. Thank you.